Things are going to be a little different today, but bear with me because there's a point. This morning we're going to be in the book of Ruth. I want you to find your Bibles, your cell phones, however you choose to read scripture. We're going to be in the book of Ruth chapter 1. Now, the book of Ruth is an interesting book and a lot of people use the book of Ruth when they do marriage vows, when they do um, they, they do women's conferences. The book of Ruth is used for so many various uh, situations, but the book of Ruth really has so much inside of it that you really cannot exhaust it as a resource. Um, the book of Ruth is a jewel hidden among a lot of the Old Testament books. And this week I was listening to different sermons and reading different commentaries. And this, this sermon, this, this idea came out from this, from reading the book of Ruth. And today the title of my sermon is called Kissers and Cleaners. Or Kissers and Cleaners, whichever one you want to call it. And in this book, and reading about the story of Naomi and her family and Ruth and Orpah, I saw a lot of parallels between the church and Christians in the church. And today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build up to my main point, so bear with me um, as I kind of set the scene, set the storyline. But we're going to be in Ruth chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 8 through 14. So if you've got your word, say word. word. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughter. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it, it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Now, the, the book of Ruth, as I've told you, it's mostly focused on as a love story. And you know the story of Ruth and how, you know, how she lost her husband, married Boaz, and became the great-great-grandmother of King David, was in the lineage of the Messiah, and all that is, is good. But this morning, I want to look at some of the different personality traits of some of the different characters in this, and how it really parallels to a lot of people in church today. Now, prior to this moment, before Ruth and Orpah were associated with Naomi, we read in verse 1, and uh, verse 1 through 3 actually, that there was a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi. And they had two sons, Malon and Chilion, and there was a famine in the land. And so because of the famine, Malon, Chilion, Elimelech, and Naomi, they leave their home and they go to the land of Moab. Now, we hear the word famine, and we can sort of imagine what's going on, but being from America and having the amount of great resources we have, we have no idea what a famine looks like. Just look down at your torso and tell me if you have <laughs> missed any meals this week. I can hardly breathe with my suit coat buttoned, so I can tell you I have not missed a meal this week. There have been times we have been hungry, but we've never starved. Now, in this story and in the Bible, we realize that the names of these people mean something. Naomi means pleasant. Elimelech means God is king. But their children's names are very peculiar. Malon and Chilion, one of their names means sickly. The other names means to pine away. Now, historians don't know. If they were born sick, if they developed a sickness, we don't know. But this gives us an image that they had sick children. So imagine having sick children who needed nourishment, who needed provision, and a famine rises up in the land. So they've got to figure out how to make a decision. They've got to figure out what to do. Now, it was interesting to me that a famine was mentioned, and especially where it was mentioned. It said that there was a famine in Bethlehem of Judah. Now, if you don't know your Bible, 
If you don't know what things mean, this is a very peculiar verse because Bethlehem means house of bread. Bethlehem, house of bread and praise, is what the Hebrew name is. So a place that's known for plentiful, a place that's known to be blessed, a place that's known for a large amount of grain and oats and things that produce bread has a famine. So a place where you're supposed to be able to go and get fed is dry. There's a drought. There's no food. Say what you want to say, but historians will tell you that Bethlehem is a parallel to the church. Because Jesus was from Bethlehem. The bread of life came from the house of bread. Where does Jesus, or where is Jesus supposed to reside in the house of God? So there's a famine in the house of bread, literally. But today we've got a famine in the house of bread, spiritually. All right, man. Because we've got churches. Oh, I feel that. I hope God, you better help me this morning. I feel and I know a lot of churches that are supposed to be a house of prayer and praise have become nothing more than a house of entertainment. All right. They become nothing more than a place where a bunch of people gather and they smile and they hug and they laugh and, and all these things go on and they come and they get their they get their fancies tickled and they go home the same way that they came. There's a lot of churches that should have shut down when Jesus left. Because he left long ago. There's a lot of churches that are feeding, that are feeding the people nothing more than watered down, sugary gospel, feel good, you're okay, I'm okay, and they neglected the word altogether. I don't know if I'm mad or anointed this morning, but I'm here soon. Because I have seen it. I have nothing against the man of church. Please don't get me wrong. I came from one. Good church. But I've seen plenty of them. Their youth groups, all they do, they have a 10-minute devotion, and they go and play for an hour and a half. I've seen enough of them where they go into a Bible study, and they'll have a 10-minute devotion, and they eat and talk the rest of the time. They ain't nothing wrong with eating, but when your whole focus and gathering is to eat instead of feed yourself the Word, that's not a Bible study. That's just a dinner with a little scripture involved. All right, now. So we've got a famine in the house of bread, and people have no idea. We've got spiritually malnourished people because the house of bread has a famine. I'm going to preach it whether you're going to help me or not this morning. That's okay. So there's a famine in the house of bread. And here these two are, and they've got these sick children, and they've got to make a decision. Because the barley is dried up. There's no more oats. It hadn't rained, so the springs are drying up. Things are starting to look a little, a, a little just sparse and a little despairing. And so they've got to make a decision on whether they're going to stay or whether they'll leave. And Elimelech decides that it's time to pick up, pack up, and peel out. We ain't staying. We're going to go to Moab. Because I bet you they got food in Moab. Now, you may say, well, I would have done the same thing. Really? Really? Do you not realize that the Moabites were cursed by God because they made Israel sin in the wilderness? You don't realize that they were leaving a place that was supposed to be spiritually chosen and blessed by God to go to a land that was cursed? Hello, somebody. It's interesting that when a famine arises, what kind of company you'll keep? Oh, it's right. It's real interesting when things, oh, God, I feel it. It's real interesting when things stop going the way you want them to at church, the kind of things you'll start saying. It's real interesting when things get a little uncomfortable how some people will start acting toward the preacher and toward other people because things just don't feel like they used to. Things just, they, 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 uh, I remember the days when, 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 when it, I used to get goosebumps and I used to feel and I used to shout all over the floor. And, and, but it's dry now. It's got to be that preacher. It's dry now. It's got to be that worship pastor. It's dry now. It's got to be the fact we put a TV up instead of singing out of the red back. Oh, I said that. <laughs> Oh, it's dry. It's got to be everybody else's fault. It can't be the fact that I don't pray throughout the week. 
Holy? That sounds like the Holy Ghost said that one. <laughs> it can't be the fact that, that, that my worship is based off the fact whether they sing the song I like or not. I'm telling you, when it's all over me, we can be here now. Come on. You've got two different kinds of people in this story, first off. You've got your Elimelechs and your Boaz. Your Elimelechs are those that when things start getting a little uneasy, they take off. I, I ain't staying here. I ain't waiting this out. No, no, no. I'm going to find me somewhere else. If I can't get fed here the way I want to get fed, I'm going to go over there. And I'm just going to leave this church. I'm going to leave that one because I'm just getting a little uncomfortable. They're making me feel a little convicted. They, 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 they did it stepping all over my toes, so I'm just going to get on out of here. I, oh, God. They, so you got your Elimelech and your Boaz. Your Elimelech are those that will take off and they don't think nothing else about it. Then you got your Boaz. Those are you people that they know famines happened before, and God got them through it before, so God will get them through it again. Yeah. They've been through it. They'll say, this ain't nothing new. We've been through a drought before. We've had trouble before, but these are my people. This is my house. This is where I'm from. I'm not taking off at the first sign of trouble. Devil, you're not going to take this field. You're not going to take my house. I'm committed here. We need some more Boaz people in the church. We need some more people that's going to stick it out and tough it out even when the going gets tough. Because I'm going to tell you, when you take off, pack up, and peel out, you're just going to keep doing it. Church after church after church. I'm going to tell you, church is not about how you feel. If you've got an emotional based salvation, you're not saved. All right. My, my. Amen. Stay on. If it's all about how you feel good, I'm sorry, sister. It, it, that is not what Jesus died for. If it's all about you getting a goosebump, you are not saved. That's not what Jesus died for. Do you think Paul felt happy when he was in a prison? You think Peter felt good when he was well going to be nailed to a cross just like his Jesus? Absolutely not. But they had a Boaz spirit on them and said, I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to keep on keeping on because I know that God will show up again. Look at your neighbor and ask, are you an Elimelech or a Boaz? Look at him and So you got your two different people in that arena. And this ain't even my sermon. This is just my introduction. Come on, Come on. So then, a little late decides, I'm going to pack up and peel out. I'm done. I'm gone. And they take off the mower. And the, the, the Bible says, I think it's the Bible or the commentary, I can't remember which, that they were there about 10 years. Well, as the time progressed, eventually a little like died. And if that wasn't bad enough, not long after that, they only had two children. Later on in Chile, they died too. So now here she is in a strange land. She's got no security. She's got no money, no social security, no children, no heirs, nothing. All she's got is two daughters in law who were Moabites. So she's got, she, she, she's sitting here and she starts getting bitter. If you read on, when she goes back to Bethlehem, they'll say, well, there's Naomi. She said, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. But, but I want you to go back. Look, God never told them to leave. Never once did he say, that's the Lord, go to Noah. Never once. God ain't, oh, oh, oh. Lord, you help me. God ain't going to tell you to leave a good spiritually filled church for a dead one that does nothing but entertain. Just like God ain't going to tell you to leave your wife for another woman. That's right. Pastor, you're being mean today. Come on. I've always told you, I'd rather offend you into heaven than call you to hell. That ain't my style. And I'm telling you, God 
God's debt with me all week on this. She got bitter. And she said, God dealt bitterly with me. It wasn't God's fault. It was hers. Her and Elimelech made the decision. But she's got nothing left. She's lost everything. Her husband's dead. Her children's gone. She's got no security. Nothing. She's desolate. She's got to make a decision. Look at that. That tells me your attitude towards church will affect your children. The way you act and respond in church is going to affect the way your children respond to church. Her children died in Noah, a strange land in the world, if you will, all because of her and Elimelech's attitude toward the house of bread. Because things got a little uneasy. Things started to get dry. Things started to, to get to, just, just to get down to the nitty gritty. And they weren't willing to put in the work. So they took off. And then they hard and chilly on those men and worldly women. They're robots. God told them not to do it. But they go off, they intermingle, and they die in Moab. Let's just say they die in the world. Because mom and daddy had a sour attitude toward the house of bread. Don't sit there and talk about and whine and cry, oh God, I don't know why my children don't go to church. I don't know why they don't live right when you don't do it yourself. Oh. Woo. You set the example. Amen. Parents, I'm going to tell you, my parents were not perfect. They had their flaws. My in-laws are sitting right here. They ain't perfect. They have their flaws, this one especially. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Our mamas and our daddies, they made sure church was a priority. They made sure that prayer was the first response. And can I tell you that because of that, we are who we are today. I give God all praise and glory, but it's because he gave us parents who set the example. Don't be like Elimelech and Naomi and take off as soon as the going gets tough. You stay firm. You stay faithful, and your children will be blessed from generation to generation. That's God's promise. So she's desperate. She ain't got nobody but these two foreign daughter-in-laws. And she's got to make a decision. What do I do? Where do I go? And in verse 6, I'm pretty sure, she heard in the land of Moab that God had visited his people with bread. Folks, it ain't dry here right now. I'll tell you that. But dry season packed. Every church goes through and it's the season of growth. And when the bread is slack, you've got to stay faithful and remember, it may be slack now, but God will visit his house again. I'm here to tell you, you may not feel like revival's happening, but if you'll hold on, and if you'll keep praying, and you'll keep staying faithful, God will visit his people with bread again. The bread is on the way. The rain is on the way. But you're only going to be a benefit of the blessing if you stay in the house of bread. Come on. So she hears there's bread in the house again. And it says they pick up and her two daughter-in-law start following her back to Bethlehem. Somewhere along the line, she decides it's not a good idea for the two to go with her. So she starts discouraging them. She starts telling them, I think it's 11 through 13, she starts saying, look, I'm too old to have another husband. I'm too old to have any more children. Even if I was to get pregnant tonight, you, you'd have to wait a whole long time to get married, and you don't want to do that. You just go back to your mama's house, go find you a man in Moab, and you just go on, I'll go by myself. And once both of them said, no, we'll stay with you, we'll stay with you. And she said, uh-uh, no, I can't have all this. You just go on back home. Then it said, the hearing of this news, you see the response of the two daughter-in-law. This is where I've been wanting to get to. 
said they lifted up their voices and wept again. And then it said, Orpha kissed Naomi, but Ruth clung to Naomi. Ruth held on. Orpha kissed and ran. What's your point, Brother Drake? While Elimelech and Boaz represent people's faithfulness to church, Ruth and Orpha represents people's attitudes in worship. The Bible says, kiss the son lest he be angry. Kiss means worship in a sense. The Bible also talks about holding on to the horns of the altar, which again means tearing in prayer and worship. Orpah was a kisser. Ruth was a cleaner. I'm getting there. Hold on. Orpah, when she realized that Naomi had nothing more to offer her, when she realized Naomi couldn't have another baby, when she realized the benefits had dried up, that dope dinner took off. Because that's where she was. She said, I don't get nothing from this. I'm done. Bye now. Bye, sugar. I'm done. You ain't got nothing left for me. I'm going to spill it again. You can help me. But Ruth held on to her. And you know the famous words, where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. We know those words. But this response of these two reveal a lot of our responses to worship. In every church, you've got your kissers and you've got your cleaners. Your kissers are the ones that as long as they're singing my song, I'm going to get up and I'm going to, oh, God is good, but if they ain't, That music's too loud. I don't like the way they sang that song. That microphone's squealing. That's good preacher, Brother Drake. Keep on. Thank you. I, I, I'll, wait. I'll keep on going because I'm going to get my point across this morning. <laughs> you got your kissers that they'll come in and they'll worship. Get a little goosebump. Get a little feel good. They'll worship as long as everything, they get a benefit from God. Their worship's all about me. What can I get? The neutrals. That's how they worship. God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. It's all about me, 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 me. They come in with this attitude of, God, ain't you glad? I took out some time in my day this morning just to show up in your house. God, I, I think I deserve that raise. I think I deserve that old shot car. I think I deserve all that. And they get all super spiritual, but their heart ain't no more worshiping God than what their lips are. Come on, Come on. Jesus said about the Pharisees, they are me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Right. See, when Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and took off, that revealed she didn't love her. Because if she loved her, she'd have stayed with her. She'd have said, it don't matter what you can give me. I'm going to stick it out. But she kissed and ran, so she revealed she never once cared about Naomi, only her son. Only the benefits that would come from the inheritance. See, when we don't show God honor, regardless of whether we like the songs they're singing or not, we're showing we don't really love God. We're revealing the true state of our heart. We're showing God, you don't have priority in here. It's, it's about me. Because if I feel good, woo, yeah, thank you, Lord. If I don't feel good, you know, there's a lot of people that don't worship because they ain't got worship in their hearts. Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can't draw from something you ain't got. Hello? You ain't going to get a praise out if you might be praying throughout the week. You ain't going to be able to produce a praise.
praise if you ain't been reading your word throughout the week. Why? Because worship will witness what you've read. You ain't going to be able to pull out an empty vessel. You've got to be full. Jesus said that they will worship me in spirit and in truth. He said, out of the abundance of the belly will flow rivers of living water. Living water ain't going to come from a dry brook. So you got your kissers. Worship's all about me. It's about as long as they sing that song, I ask them to sing. As long as, as long as we sing two red back hymnals and one contemporary or two contemporary and one red back hymnal, or if we sing a cappella or with the drums or with the guitar, if all as they do what I want them to do, and I'll worship. But God, I ain't doing it. Not if they don't do it to my way. Come on. But you cleaners. Oh, you cleaners. They're a different story. Oh, yeah. They're the ones that they say, God, that music may not be to my liking, but I'm going to worship anyway. Right. They may say, God, I've had a horrible week. Yes. And I really don't feel it, but I'm going to lift my hands and give you glory anyway. You clingers, you roots are those that will say, God, you, I may not be getting a blessing right now. I may feel like I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. I may feel like a thousand miles from you, but God, I'm going to cling, and I'm going to keep holding on because I know that you are worthy of the praise. The clingers are the ones that know it's not about me. It's not about how I feel. It's not about whether I feel excited or not. It's about the fact that God is worthy of glory and honor and praise despite ourselves. True worship are those who know that it is not anything to do with their preferences. It has nothing to do, and before I say this, let me make sure I make it clear. Our music is not bad music, okay? we got some of the best musicians I've ever seen in a rural church, okay? But you got people that I came from a church like this. They have got orchestra. They've got the whole nine yards. And there's people that still won't worship because it don't fit their life. Mm-hmm. And they got nothing to do with the talent. Don't you blame it on Misty. <laughs> she said, please. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you, and I, I am not lifting this woman up, but Ray knows, we all know, worship is almost, it's actually probably more important than what I'm doing. Amen. Did you feel the difference in us not having music before I preached? Was it just me? Did you feel how awkward it was? I saw your faces. <laughs> I said, open your Bible and you go. <laughs> There ain't no music and you're going, did heaven shut down this morning? I, mean, <laughs> I saw you. I did that on purpose. Because week after week, month after month, time after time, we get so caught up in ourselves and we come to church and we view worship as just something we got to suffer through. A ceremony. An entertainment time, a time where we where, where that music was good, but just let Brother Drake preach and we'll go on home. I'm calling all of you out. Not just one, all of us, me included. Because God reminded me, He said, How many times did you worship because they sang Waymaker or they sang Evidence, but when they sang a uh, hymnal, you're just sitting there. And I love hymnals. It's the heart. Where is your heart this morning? Is your heart really sold out to God? Because if it is, you'll worship regardless. Amen. It ain't going to matter if they screech and squeal up here. It ain't going to matter if it sounds like the Gaither vocal band or not. What matters is, God, my heart's going to give you praise whether anybody else does or not. Because I know what you've done for me. I know that you're worthy regardless of everything else around me. God, I'm going to give you praise because you're the one who's worthy. Church, worship, singing, it is not something that God just threw in there so we could get happy. Do you know there are angels that continually walk around the throne singing, holy, 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 worthy. 
And that's all we're going to do for all of eternity. If we're going to encircle the throne and say, worthy, worthy, holy, holy, what? And you go, you, it's not going to be about whether you feel like it or not, because that's what he deserves. We need an attitude adjustment this morning. We need to realign our focus on worship and realize it's not about me. Now, I prayed about this because I know when a Pentecostal preacher starts talking about worship, some of you say, well, I, I ain't about to shout and run. I ain't about, I'm not asking you to. She, if she ever shouts and runs, you better get in the water because something happened. <laughs> I told her, I said, if you start praying, you better not stop because I'll be right behind you because I know it's God. But she's, I know she worships, I see on her face. I know when somebody's worshiping because even sometimes those that are shouting, it's as empty. It ain't about the shout. It ain't about the calisthenics. Then about what you got, you know, if you're carrying the TV, if it's filled gold, it don't matter about all that. Whether it's one hand, two hand, kneeling, bowing, it don't matter. It's about what's in here. Your heart needs to be what's set on worship, not just your mouth, not just your mind. Worship is imperative to our relationship with God. Worship prepares the atmosphere for him to come and do what he needs to do. While the anointing is here this morning, it would have y'all probably have seen this a whole lot better if we'd have had singing first. Because you had to kind of prepare yourself. You see what I'm saying? Is anybody else getting? Hello? Don't, 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 don't shut down on me. Folks, I did not come here to beat you over the head this morning. I did not come to make you feel guilty. All I know is that Monday night I was leaving right here at this altar. And I had my, my little prayer card. And I was writing out my prayers. And I, and I was just, I was trying. And I, I, was, I was in the presence. And I was just feeling God. And all I just heard, I, I'm not going to say the Lord told me. I'm just going to say I kept impressed in my spirit. And I just heard these words. We will never truly experience God until we learn to worship. Amen. Because the Lord inhabits the praises of his name. Amen. The Chinese version will tell you the Lord rides on the praise of his people. Amen. You want to see a healing in the house? You better learn how to pray. You want to see God bring revival to this house? You better learn how to pray. Yeah, we need to pray. Yeah, we need to work. Because God will bless laziness. But you better learn how to praise. Because praise gets the attention of heaven. Amen. Because when you praise, you're joining in with the multitudes who from eternity's past have been singing holy, holy, worthy, worthy, holy, holy, worthy, worthy. In Revelation, they said that they sung a new song. When you start singing, they're singing that song with you. Great is thy faithfulness. How great thou art. It is well with my soul. Thou, you are the way maker. I see the evidence of your glory. I, the goodness of God is running after me. The place of freedom is here when I lift my hands. When we start singing and we get out of our comfort zone and we get out of our own little self-centered world and we start saying, God, this is about you. This is not about me. This is not about how I feel. It's not about what it looks like. It's about the fact you are God. You are the I am. You are the way maker. You are the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the great I am. It's about you, God. Misty, I'm almost done. Musicians, come on. I told them this morning. I said, don't sing first. And they got me the same look all y'all do. I said, you'll sing. Because it'd be one thing for them to sing first. And then we preach this. Because then you'll think, well, next Sunday, I'll get that right. And next Sunday, never comes. This morning, now 
is the time to worship. Now is the time you've received the word, you've heard it, now it's time to put it in action. I'm not expecting y'all to start shouting all over the place and take, I, I told you, that's not what this is about. Whether you raise your hand, bow your head, you better make sure your heart's in it. Don't sit on your pew with a sour look and tell me you love God. If you love somebody, you'll express it. One way or the other. Hello? So this morning, if you are physically able, I know some of you need to sit. You can worship and sit. But if you are physically able, I want you to stand. And they're going to sing their two songs that they've prepared. And we're going to let the Lord adjust our attitudes this morning. We're going to let the Lord adjust our perspective and shift our understanding and say, God, this is not about me. This is not about how I feel. I'm not going to be a kisser this morning. I'm not going to show up and kiss and run. I'm going to clean. Because he's worthy. He deserves the glory and the honor and the praise because he is God. Amen? Amen? So prepare your hearts for worship and make no 